This is Internet Marketing. Brought to you by Site Visibility at sitevisibility.com. This is Internet Marketing. Before we start today, we have one request. If you genuinely are enjoying the show here, then um, please leave us a review on iTunes or your podcast app because it really helps us to grow the podcast and ensures that we bring you great marketing tips and advice each week. Now, today I'm joined by Phil Singleton, author of SEO for Growth. Phil, how are you doing? Great. I'm so happy to be here today. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. And uh, you're, um, you're, you're calling, or I'm calling you, and you're in uh, sunny Kansas. I mean, it's not really sunny at the moment, is it? It actually is. It is pretty sunny. It's it's got to get a fr- little frost on on the um, ground today after like a sixty degree day yesterday. Yeah, so it's kind of weird, but um, it was cloudy yesterday and it's cleared up today. So fantastic! I think, I, you, I think you brought the sunshine for me. Thanks. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm I'm glad I could help in some way. I'm becoming quite interested actually in the meteorological aspects of the USA. I've learned that um, especially this time of year, we have a big sort of blob of cold that comes down, don't you, from the north? So it's all very cold unless you go quite a long way south. We do, it's just, and it's just like that. It seems like a kind of blob kind of comes down and it pulls back. So we've got really um, uh, unstable weather around this time of year, and but I think the cold is probably going to be coming for good here pretty soon. All right, let's start off uh, moving away from the weather. Tell us about yourself and how you got into SEO and digital marketing. Yeah, I took a very unconventional, you know, path. I went to school um, for business and finance and rolled out of that. Um, luckily, I, I you know in my in my early twenties, I rolled into a a job. You know, so to have one, I was really happy, but it, I was with an insurance company, so mm. not the most exciting place to be. But you know, I was three or four years into that place where you know, I was in a cubicle, uh, kind of doing a single focus job, and every kind of day that went by, I'd look at the alarm clock and be like, oh no, I have to go to work. And I got to work, and I was like, oh no, this day is lasting forever type of thing. So mm. you're almost kind of in these cubicle, you know, soul-crushing cubicle jobs. Right. And I just knew after a certain period of time that, that this wasn't going to be for me. And um, I think I got to one point where I was like, I have got to do something different um, because I just felt like my life, my destiny was basically being pulled down somebody else's, so to speak. Yeah. And if I didn't make it, and every year that goes by, you kind of, I, I felt like I was kind of getting pigeonholed into a um, almost like a specialty, and I didn't want to be like some of the guys around me that had been there for twenty or thirty years, you know, in the insurance industry. And probably each year that went by, it got harder to leave because you know they're making halfway decent money and yeah. doing something that they didn't really like to do. So I made a drastic move and I said, really in the course of about two weeks, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I quit my job. I sold all my stuff and I moved to Asia. Wow. Just like right out of the blue. My parents thought I'd lost my mind. All my friends thought <laughs> I'd lost my mind. I probably did lose a little bit of it. Um, but I was like, man, I'm going to totally change my um, career path trajectory and do something totally different and you know, have no regrets type of thing. And I ended up moving um, to Taiwan of all places because I wanted to study Mandarin and I was not uh, quite brave enough to go to, into China at that time. Yeah. Because um, this is going back like 20 years. So. And I did. I went there, and it was great. I learned learned Chinese. Um, ended up meeting my wife today. Uh, went back to the states, and then um, got my MBA. And I got a job right back out of school. It took me there another eight years. But what got me into SEO and digital marketing was I had ended up during the dot com era working for some you know like software companies and tech companies. Mm. And when that thing popped a year or two after that, I'd been doing some consulting work. And this one company called DVDX Copy, I don't know if that rings a bell to you or anybody might mm-hmm. be listening, but there was a, a company, Napster, before that, right, that had all the, the audio issues. I remember the Napster. There was, there was one, the, the, the d- digital video version of that was called DVDX Copy and enabled people to you know, make backup uh, movies of their, of their um, movies. Mm. They did really great in the United States, but got in an ba- epic battle with Hollywood and ended up losing, but they sold the crap out of the software for like three years. Well, I had to have happened to be in Asia and, 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 and that ended up – and I worked with these guys trying to expand their business into Asia. And when Hollywood took them down in the U.S., it was still you know okay to sell this software around the world and mm. online. And this company basically just fell in my lap. So that's when I learned the power of Google and the power of like online selling because even at that time – this is going back about 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, most of our sales were coming from affiliate marketers, right? And the big ones that had the, these websites and their forums and the precursors to blogs and all this kind of stuff that had the traffic for these audiences, they were getting like 50% of the software sale. So this was all new to me because I was like – I was a finance nerd and it, this company just kind of fell into my lap. And I, I said I could run it not knowing that I, I could, but what could I do? I was going to take advantage of the opportunity that came in front of me. Mm. Uh, so I learned a ton about you know software development 
development and web design. And in particular, it really struck me how powerful Google was in terms of driving um, affiliate sales because people were looking how to you know, copy DVD movies and get DVD software and this kind of stuff. And that what really struck me also was how in, a, in an affiliate sale, we were getting for the big affiliates, we were getting like 50% of the sale. So a $99 piece of software, we'd get $50 of that. I had 25 mm. employees, investors, product support, our piece of that pie got whittled down to nothing were these guys that were the affiliate marketers you know we were cutting them fifty eighty thousand dollar checks a month again this is going back 15 years ago and we weren't, weren't their only affiliates or the bigger ones and so they, these guys and i don't know they were just running their own websites and and probably working like an hour a day and just making a kill yet killing out of it so it was at that time i was like wow i'm on the wrong side of the equation follow the roi trail it goes to google and basically your own website and i think that experience really kind of woke me up to the power of Google and digital marketing, all this kind of stuff. So long story short, moved back to the U.S. to kind of start a family, landed in the Midwest where I have roots. And I ended up doing this one on a trade deal. I ended up doing this one ugliest version of a one-page um, Microsoft front page website on a barter deal for this auto detailer. Yeah. And um, had, I had no business doing this either because, again, I, I'm an outsider. I didn't learn this business like some of these guys did, do today. You know, they grew up with it. I, you know, I came from the outside. And I promised this guy a website that I had no business doing because I'd never built a website before. But I figured, hey, I'm going to do this. If I flub it up, I'll pay somebody else to bail me out. But um, you know, I did a barter <laughs> deal with him. Yeah. And I ended up making a website, one-page website, very ugly but I got it to rank in like 60 days he calls me up not long after and says hey Phil I don't know what you've done but you've changed my business you've changed my life yada 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 and I was like wow at that time again I'm over 30 years old I was like I know what I want to be when I grow up you know, I had the most rewarding conversation with a business person that I've ever had so yeah. it was very rewarding that way but it was also like I can make some money off of this you know what I mean because yes. he's making money and I can start charging people so that one little barter website on that front page 2005 is rolled into an agent that so that's see that we've done literally hundreds of custom WordPress website and have scores of of SEO digital clients that we have right now, and I've, I've you know built a thriving digital agency off of that. So that's my story. It's kind of a rant, but um, it's kind of a winding thing. And unless you don't know how I got here, I guess it um, it adds some perspective. You know, it's a really exciting story. It's funny actually because when you were mentioning the you were in a cubicle at the beginning, I just had this. I was picturing the first opening few scenes of the Matrix, the original Matrix film, and I thought for a minute you were going to suddenly being pursued by two men in dark suits and glasses. <laughs> That's about how fast I ran out of there <laughs> when I decided I was going to move. So, yeah, it's a great uh, it's a So, great um, tell us about the book and the SEO for Growth. How did that come about, the book project? You know, there was, there's been so many, obviously, you know, big twists and changes um, in the way SEO has evolved. So, you know, to me, I'm a natural introvert. So what I liked about SEO was that in the early days when you could do a lot of things on the website and with, you know, back office backlink, which was what drove the industry for a long time, you know, I could I could make a big difference with people without ever having to meet uh, meet folks or, or um, you know, do, do a lot of extroverted type of activities. Of course, that's changed a lot now, right? But what, what ended up happening, what I saw was, geez, you know, the nature of SEO and getting results of people has really changed. It's kind of become a more holistic thing. I really got to understand the broader picture of marketing to really help my clients out more. But I think you know, have it get be positioned to get better uh, long term results really for SEO because you know they talked about when I say they, I say Google talked about content being king for a long time. But I think after this panda and penguin, all these uh, subsequent. Mm. changes came up they really started to mean it right so what that meant yeah. for me was i really got to get my head around the broader context of digital marketing and i was drawn into duct tape marketing john jance i ended up reading his book to kind of get up to speed i really liked what i read there because it kind of you know, gave me a good broad picture of it and then i got pulled into his uh, consulting network he's got about 120 uh, certified consultants in his now authored work and yeah. at that point i kind of became the seo guy within there i showed him my stuff um, I pitched him on a book project, and I think he I developed a relationship and, and some trust um, with him, and he was you know very happy to come on, and we, we co-authored this book, and that's how I was able to kind of basically because at that time you know he's he's basically a handshake away from every digital influencer out there, and he is one mm -hmm. himself, so that was a great way for me to kind of influence hack, right? I kind of rode his co coattails, and I did so by joining his network and and really trying to show him my best stuff. Because um, I had the early intention of saying, hey, you know, I'm never going to be able to – he got started like in the early 2000s. It's going to take a really long time for me to try and build that grassroots organically in terms of influence. Mm. How can I leverage somebody else? I picked John because he's here in Kansas City and I love, I love the duct tape stuff. And that, that's really how I, I got the book going. Now, you've had a quite a sort of unique 
sort of journey and view, haven't you, um, of sort of ev- the agency business and SEO? What challenges do you see in the agency sort of sort of now and sort of looking forward, and how how do you overcome them? I think one of the biggest things, and I think probably agencies of all sizes still see this to some degree today, but I'm, I'm focusing on sm- larger small businesses, small businesses and that kind of stuff. So I think one of the first challenges is how do you get you know a client to understand that the website, re- their website really is the key to everything. It's not a digital brochure. It's got to be perceived as a marketing platform mm. and it's got to be kind of, you know, we all got to have a good web centric strategy right now to really get the, the most benefits out of stuff. I think that's a hard thing, especially here in the States because you get, you know, we're brainwashed on TV with the web builder websites telling us that all you need is a $25 a month or a $50 a month website and you can yeah. get listed on Google. Mm. And it really kind of cheapens the whole thing and brainwashes, I think, the entire, not just small businesses. It kind of gives people the impression that a website's really still more of a digital brochure and you shouldn't have to spend a lot of time and effort on it. Of course, a lot of us in the digital agency world know that that's a lot different, right? So our whole approach is we got to get in there and convince people, hey, we got to understand your business, reverse engineer a website from the ground up based mm-hmm. on your ideal clients and their search behavior and all this kind of stuff. It takes a lot more time. So you're not going to get that with a $1,000 website or a $50 a month web builder. So that's a challenge, I think, in and of itself is to try and get people convinced that, you know, they've got to build a real website from the ground up right and position it, you know, to, to yeah. be kind of the hub of their marketing. The other thing I think is, is really big is, you know, we still, you know, a lot of businesses, I don't care how big or small they are, a lot of them when they're looking for outside help, they're searching for some kind of a tactical Band-Aid, right? Mm. They all need, really, they all need some kind of strategic help and somebody to help them tie it all together so they get the full benefit out of it. But they tend to look for something, right? They look for, I need a web designer or I need PPC help or I need an SEO guy. Um, <clears throat> So for us, our angle is really pitching SEO a little bit more because it's a great way to come in and say, let's look at the, your business and marketing the way Google looks at it. And there's a way and approach that we have in the book that kind of um, helps people tie it all together. And that being said, when you start talking about like SEO and things, you know, some of this stuff, any digital marketing really, but in a whole plan, but particularly with SEO, you need time to show results, right? And I'm not talking about some people are going to go in there and maybe push the limit with you know PBNs and other types of gray hat things that might be able to move the needle a little bit click quicker. But if you're looking mm-hmm. for a, a sustainable, long-term, healthy relationship with a client you, and you do it the right way, you really need more time, I think, to start showing, to roll things out and to start showing results, at least from the organic standpoint. So getting people past that, I call SEO fatigue, about that six to 12 month period where you've probably shown them a lot of work and you've actually probably shown them a lot of traffic and, and things like that, but they might not necessarily have seen the full benefit of the ROI in terms of sales or getting the leads in right now, that to me becomes a challenge. So mm-hmm. figuring out some way to position an engagement so that they buy into it earlier and are willing to give the initial program that time. Because for us, you know, we do lose clients sometimes in that six to 12 month period, but after they stay with us a year and see the full benefits of things, we tend to have them for years and years. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're in the business for. We're not in the business for a one-time web gig or six months of an SEO, because that's where lots of like, where the, you know, a lot of the lower margin work goes into it. It's really trying to get people to, to become part of their team. And I think that's a challenge. So trying to find and position an engagement that gets people excited and gets some buy-in so that they're willing you know, to look at this more of a long-term. Because you know, sometimes tell people, you tell people four to six months or six to 12 months, they still hear sometimes or hope for four to six weeks. Yes, or six yes. To 12, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. Customer so expectations. That, that's a problem, I think, that a lot of us, and I think will resonate with a lot of your listeners. Yeah. And, and how do you overcome that piece? Yeah. So... What strategies and tactics are getting results for you and your clients uh, right now, Phil? So, you know, this year has been a really big year for me in terms of I've gotten a lot more uh, involved with with podcasting. And it's one of those things where I think it's like the greatest thing ever type of a deal. And it's one of those things where guys like you and and your company obviously um, have been doing it a long time. So it seems like that happens every one or two years. I'm just like kicking myself why I haven't started earlier. But Mm. I initially tried to... to, um, think about, okay, I'm going to start my own podcast. And then I started thinking, okay, maybe a way to dip my toes into it is to get booked on other podcasts. And I started doing that. So once I started getting booked on other folks' podcasts as a guest or as a guest expert, I started to see some of the benefits that were coming in that were, I thought, really fantastic for a relatively short period of time that I had to spend. Okay. So, and what I like to do when I say this is, 
I like to compare this to a very popular form of content marketing, which is guest blog posting, right? So yeah. you have to go out and either hire somebody to do this, or if you do it or something like I do it internally, I'm going to write a thousand or a 1500 word blog post and really try and get my good stuff so I can get it placed on a, an authoritative website that's good quality that's actually going to help my business or help my clients. It's a ton of work. Mm. It's a ton of work to do that. You have to go pitch it. It's starting to get re- starting. It's already really spammy. Um, there's a lot of clients that won't, that, that counts that won't actually do it. I think it still works and it's going to be a part of digital marketing for a long time, especially on SEO um, engagements. But if you think about podcast guesting, you most podcast folks that have podcasts already are advanced content marketers. They have great websites that have a lot of value. The podcast that they have already makes their site more, I think, valuable and higher quality than sites of a similar size without a podcast. Yeah. But what's really fascinating about being a guest on somebody's show is that they end up doing show notes for you. And they write an entire almost guest blog post about you and mm. they do the work. They do the work. Yeah. They do the work in terms of getting on the show. They'll make social graphics for you that are great and have high production value. Um, a lot of times they'll distribute it. Of course, the onus is also on the, the guest to do their job to go out and distribute it, but that's kind of like a similar win-win there. But mm. you do all this stuff and you spend you know, 20, 30 minutes on, on a show and there's just all these tremendous value that you get out from a relatively short period of time that I think it's the one of the most it's the most powerful form of content marketing that I've ever done because there's so many benefits you get off of it, right? You yeah. get you get access to a trusted audience that somebody brings you on. You get that somebody wrote something about you. They wrote a blog post. They put your backlinks in it that are, are the purest form, I think, of backlink building that there are out there because you earn them by bringing your A game onto the show, right? Yes. But yeah. the gift keeps on giving for me because what we've done is we'll go in after a show and we'll say, hey, if you thought I did a really good job, would you mind rating me as a guest on your show? So I've done this in a way where I've actually been able to stack up my reputation because I've tied reputation management into it, right? Yeah. Where we've done that and been able to get like 40 you know, reviews in various places that have helped me. It almost helped me build up my word, word of mouth um, mark and that kind of stuff. We've also gone a secondary step and said, hey, you know what? If you're not going to transcribe the notes – why don't you let us do this at our own expense? We'll post it up on our blog post as a, almost kind of its own post yeah. and give you links back to your website and maybe a couple of weeks later type of thing. So we get another round of um, promotion out of it, but then the, you're actually giving the the um, the podcast hosting some extra benefit from from your website, right? So there's all these extra things that you can do on top of just being on the podcast where it gives you multiple wins off of it. Yeah. But – I'm kind of getting to the, that the cherry on top, and when I talk about like a process of what's really working, that guesting campaign is really, really awesome. What we've done, and when I, so this is what I did. I kind of saw this, and I was like, "Holy cow!" There's so many unused benefits that people don't even think about in terms of being a guest on other people's shows. How do we tie this into a strategy that I can use for myself and for my clients? It's really going to help us. Yeah. And help our clients. And what we've developed, I think, is a very powerful system that enables us to charge. You know, and I'm going to give you a quick, quick step back. Is my my goal in my business is to build somebody a website and charge them a fair fee for. So a ten thousand dollar website is our is our kind of our our target. Yeah. And to some people, that's going to sound expensive. To others, it's going to sound cheap, depending on where your agency's at. Um, but my really my main goal is to try and get monthly engagements that range around two to three thousand dollars a month. Now, again, some people are going to think that's low. Some people are going to think it's high. But for me, what I found is we get we've gotten engagements that are five and ten thousand dollars a month or more. But the problem with those are the clients want a pound of flesh from you. Mm. They want more time. They want in-person stuff. It's just you're basically the cost of an employee or two versus if you're in that two to $3,000 range, which is still mean- meaningful, you can still semi-scale that out as a de facto um, you know, consulting agency. So what we've done is we've tried to devise a plan where we can get a high-value, scalable service that I think does a lot um, in terms of value, but something also we can charge something like that for, and it makes perfect sense. And the way we do it is this. We do the, the first stage of it really, build the website, reverse engineer it um, from the ground up with keywords, all that kind of stuff that I think most end of blog people are doing. And, and part of that's going to be develop a plan, a blog posting plan, a social media plan, a reputation management, all the things I think that would be typical of a boutique you know, a digital marketing agency. Yeah. The next thing that we really try and do in step two is we're always doing blogging for our clients. I think blogging is still really the um, heart and soul of inbound marketing and SEO-driven um, content marketing. Yeah. So what we do for our clients is we're always 
we never do just do single blog posts almost. We, we typically are always going to do blogs in batches of 10 or 15. Hmm. And we structure them in a way that almost looks like a table of contents for a book or an ebook. Oh. And that is the end goal, right? So we're going to say, okay, let's sit down, write a list of 15 blog um, topics that could, that each individual post or chapter will be published as a standalone blog post so we can still hit our, hit our goals in terms of you know optimizing those for, for whatever keyword goals that we have and publish them out and distribute them on social media. But then we can also, at the end of that 15 works, stitch these together into a PDF for the website as a call to action, right? Build oh, our list. Like a repurpose. Exactly. Yeah. But it's almost like you're, you're pre-writing the book and you're, everybody talks about repurposing, but this is truly repurposing. I think with a with a with a hard strategy in place. Yeah. So we'll turn that those blog posts into that PDF that will again then spin that up into a Kindle. Well, then we'll, then what we'll end up doing is make you know, put that Kindle up on Amazon, which enables us to make our client an author. That's really shiny, and helps us build upon this. What we're really calling an authority driven engagement, right? So we start yeah. talk, we talked about this kind of in the green room <laughs> ahead of the show, but that's really kind of what the pitch is: is hey, hey, client, we talk about individual things we need to do to help your website get going. Uh, and they hear blog posts, they hear SEO, but they don't really see the whole thing. When you start talking to them about making you or your business an authority and trying to make you, you the leader in what you're doing, they, it really seems to resonate with folks more. Mm. So when we start laying out this four-step plan, they I think there's a lot more buy-in. One, and it kind of gets back to the last point we were talking about in terms of giving yourself time. Because if you lay the strategy out and it's in the blog posts and turning somebody into an author, they kind of get that this takes time and that there needs to be some participation in their point. And it does take time. You can't just turn some of this stuff over overnight. You actually have to roll it out and, and produce these things over the course of months and not weeks. Then the last thing that we do as part of this process, after we've created the blog strategy and distributed it and, and post on the website, after we've made a PDF that can turn into a call to action on the website, and after we've made them an author up on Amazon, um, then we turn to making a podcast guesting campaign for them. Okay? Yeah. And a, a great way to do that is to have a book because when you go pitch somebody on a podcast, having you got to have some kind of an angle. So having a book is a great way to say, hey, just like you do on any podcast or you see somebody on a TV show or on a radio show, usually they're pitching a new movie or a new book or some other type of piece of launchable piece of content that they have. So it's a natural angle. Yeah. But it also is a shiny thing. You just made them an author. You actually became – you actually made your client um, and gave them almost kind of a career milestone, right? And, mm. and it becomes just a really super shiny thing for them. But what I love about the podcast guesting thing is if you get these guys up on their own campaign where they're getting to be a guest once a, once a month or twice a month or even maybe once a week – and you get them booked on these shows and they're getting all those benefits that we talked about in terms of you know getting a guest po- getting a post up on a website and getting links you're almost helping having your client do some of the valuable SEO tactical work for themselves they're doing the actual work yes. if you set it up right yeah. Are you, are you following that? And, and it's actually really powerful stuff because they're, again, yeah. reaching audiences. They're, they're getting access to other folks' um, social media channels. Of course, we always got to position it right because you can't be every, – every different business podcast has a different form of audience. So you got to make sure that your client is pitched in a way for you that adds value to that host so they get sure. a chance to go on the show. Yeah. But this, this problems a nice, shiny, higher-ticket, long-term engagement where you can – to your client and where they're actually participating and doing some of the work for you, right? And that's really what we've moved to this year, and it's really, really powerful stuff. It's been really powerful for my business. I've been on four podcasts this year. Ne- I've never had as much benefit or value or traffic or even sales you know, that I've actually gotten as a direct result of the shows. And we've now started to kind of spin some of our clients into this process, and I think anybody can do it. I think it's a natural no-brainer for any agency owner or um, solo even digital marketer. And I think it's a great plan um, that anybody can really execute to help get people real results, but be able to charge a premium in a way that um, you can really help grow your business. I'm interested, actually, because what are your findings? Because presumably um, getting your your client uh, to be a guest on other podcasts is a proactive thing that you were helping them to do. You're, you're sort of going out there and asking podcasters, what sort of responses are you getting? Are you finding it generally quite easy to end up being a guest on other podcasts? You know, it it is. Now, I've done some outreach myself, but I, I found this thing so powerful that uh, about a month or two into it, I went and pitched John. I was like, we got to make a business out of this. So about last month, we launched our own business called podcastbookers.com. 
And we've got a full team of six people that have been doing this for years. We actually acquired them from somebody who essentially gave them up. And they've already got the book of genres. They know how to do it. They've been pitching. for So So part of it is really educating your client. And we've got a little kind of a video series that we give them. We build up one sheets for them where we've got, you know, sets of questions. And it's a kind of a nice, shiny little thing to give to a client. But we also educate them a little bit in the whole thing because you can't go on a show and start selling people stuff, right? Yes, you gotta, yeah. you got to educate. Yeah. So that's the biggest thing and is telling people you're there to bring value to the host. It's a This is a privilege to be on somebody's show who has a trusted audience. So mm. you have to bring something to them. Um, you have to know who their audience is and do a little bit of research ahead of time and try and speak to them and make sure that when you leave that show that you've given something of value that somebody can act on. So we do a lot of that stuff ahead of time. And most of the people, and this again, this isn't going to work for every single client. It's an advanced type thing yeah. where you got to get some buy into it. But you know, our approach, our ideal client is the person that wants to be the 800 pound grill in their market. Mm. So they're already a little bit driven. They're not satisfied with just puttering along like a lot of businesses are. They just don't want to lose business. They want to keep going. Mm. Um, but for the folks that really want to dominate and say, I am the best at what I do. We really want to – we're a growth-driven agency. Those kind of entrepreneurs, they want to do it you know, and they've got something to add anyway. It's just you do have to do a little bit of coaching ahead of time to, show, to tell people – Hey, um, you know, we've got to find an angle and we've got to make sure that you bring your A game. And when we do that, because you're totally right, what ends up happening is if you don't have a customized pitch for your client to every show, they don't see what the angle is themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So the the podcast booker has to be able to go to the show and say, Hey, I've got this client who's a luxury watch entrepreneur. Well, how does that how does that approach to, to your show? Well, she's a female and she's gone through, and if you're going through like maybe a, a woman's entrepreneurial type show, then you've got that angle where you can say, here's the types of things that she, so there's a little bit of, you know, I think of nuance and customization in how you pitch. Yes, yes. But if you do it the right way, you can actually get on a wide variety of, ty- of business type shows, yeah. right? And that's the key. The, the, the thing that really lowers your chance to get booking on a show is when you just try and do a spammy, here's my one sheet, can I be on the show type of thing. They don't, yeah. You didn't pitch an angle. Somebody's going to say, I don't see what the angle is. Not a good fit. Sorry. So yeah, yeah. Um, that's the key, really. I love it. I, I, authority-driven engagement. I love, I love the name as well. It's always important to give processes good names, isn't it? <laughs> Totally, because at the end of this, like we said, I mean, you got, if you don't get your client to buy into it, they don't give you much of a, a thing. And if you, you know, you pitch it in terms of something like authority, which I think is kind of out there already in terms of people understanding the importance, it just makes it, you know, it just makes it more attractive and gets it's a better chance for buy-in. I think. Yeah. So, if you had one top tip or sort of takeaway for our audience today, Phil, what would it be? I, I mean, I really believe in podcast guesting right now. It's just. For like I said, if you're going to go out and do something, they really want to bang for the buck. There's there's just too many wins off of it. Mm. Like I said, I've gotten the some of the best backlinks I've ever gotten. I've reached more people than I've ever reached probably in the history of my career because I've been on podcasts like yours. But I've also been I'm going to be on Chris Ducker's next week. I'm gonna, I've been on Entrepreneur on Fire, mm. and each time I do a podcast and able to get a review that we are able to use those reviews to get you on other podcasts. So you kind of reach your way up the, the quality chain or the, the, the audience, I guess, size type of thing. Yeah. And, and again, like the backlinks, the, even the personal relationships, like you and I are talking right now. Yeah. I think people don't realize the fact that some, on some of these podcasts I've been on just by talking with the host and sometimes they identify with what you're doing and like what you're saying, there's collaboration opportunities to come out of it. Yeah. So I've been on with, you know, 40 plus advanced content marketers and there's been some real relationships that have developed out of just by talking with the host and just because they like what we had to say or we had a similar background or whatever it is. Yeah. So I, I mean, for me, and I've gotten, I've at least gotten a hundred thousand dollars in new business out of it. I'm probably going to end up with $200,000 if we close some of the stuff that's come in. So there's real money if you do it right. You know what I mean? And that, that to me is something I hadn't even thought about earlier on because I didn't have a good call to action at the end of the ones that I've been on. And the thing that I'm really kicking myself on is I wish I would have had my own podcast before I started this because I've been on over 40 shows now. Mm. 
everybody on there is a podcast consumer. Some of them, I'm sure, really like to have what I say. I could have probably had hundreds, if not thousands, of my own audience <laughs> built up on the leverage of others if I would have been smart enough to start my own show ahead of time and built some subscriber list. So that's another thing I'm kicking myself on, but it all kind of comes together. So <laughs> the, the moral of the story is, I mean, I, you guys are like 400 shows into it. So, you, I mean, obviously you're way ahead of, you know, where, where I am, but it's never too late to start. I was going to say the same thing, actually, because I was, I was going to say, Phil, you know, it's, it's never too late to start. I'm going to sound like Yoda now. It is never too late <laughs> to start our podcast. <laughs> that was a rubbish impersonation, but I would say go for it. Right. And it's a two pieces, though. It's like you got to do the work on the podcast to give you exit. But I also think that guesting part of it is the other other side of the coin. Yeah. I think really yeah. to do it right, we should all be doing both of them. Mm. And that's kind of where my whole approach is. Like you got to think of it. I've never been on a podcast. I think I was on John's once like last year. and I really didn't even appreciate how powerful it was. Mm. And this year I've been on a bunch of them, but it's really kind of changed my business and I think changed my life. So that's that's kind of my my um, my tip. My tip is look into it, and uh, like you said, never too late to start. And uh, it's not getting any smaller. I mean, it seems like the, you know, I talked to John Jansen. He started his in 2005, and he's like, well, it was really hot for a little while. Social media came along, kind of died down. Then it's like these last two or three years, it's like blowing up. I mean, there's yeah. like podcast. Everybody's listening to it. It's part, it's part of mainstream right now. It's not going to go away. It's, yeah. it's the way younger, younger generation consumes content anyway. It's just, it's not going away. So we all have probably got to make it part of our, our content our marketing um, plan anyway. So yeah, definitely now's the time. <laughs> well, Phil, thanks so much for coming on. How can our listeners find out more about you and uh, your book, SEO for Growth? Check out, yeah, check out SEOforgrowth.com. That's kind of where the book starts. If you're an advanced SEO person, you're going to probably, it's going to find it a little bit remedial. I think one of the things you'll like about it is that it's holistic and you'll love the fact that if you hand it to your client, it, they're going to be so educated on why they need to keep you <laughs> forever. <laughs> yes. I have a thing, that's really why I wrote it is like, you know, that was one of my goals was let's have, you know, here, take this book and do it yourself or just understand the process. You know, how valuable it is. But go check that out on the site. We've actually got, um, if you get it on Amazon, there's a three book bundle. We got a free book from the guys at Yoast that's like a, a great um, website SEO one. Mm. We've got a local SEO free book and we've got one from Larry Kim, formerly of WordStream. On, on, so there's like a three free ebook bundle if you if you head back to the site with your Amazon code. And then check out kcwebdesigner.com man. that's the little Kansas City boutique agency that could. Still, still is kind of a cash cow for me in terms of a business that's growing. But it all started from one ugly purple and yellow auto detailing website. <laughs> and then I like to hang out on LinkedIn. And of course, check out podcastbookers.com. That's my new little side business that we've got where we're helping people get booked on great podcasts. Fantastic. And uh, your LinkedIn name says SEO Kansas City. Is that right? It is. That's like yeah. a, a relic old school <laughs> spammy you know, link that I just never changed back, <laughs> when, uh, back when keyword stuff URLs were helpful. But that's what I'm stuck with. So. So thanks, all. And thanks for everyone for listening. The show notes are in the usual place. Sitevisibility.com slash podcast. Um, if you're enjoying the show, please leave us a review, um, as mentioned at the beginning. Um, feedback and suggestions. The um, email is podcast at sitevisibility.com. You can tweet at sitevisibility. Remember also, we have a site visibility group on LinkedIn. Um, so I think that's all from me, Andy, and it's all from Phil. That's it. That's a big thank you for having me on the show. Absolute pleasure. And we'll see you next time on Internet Marketing. <laughs>